Okay, so we're live, and this is an impromptu conversation with uh, my friend and comrade, Uva Eichert. And you know what? Uh, we're going to talk about the business of publishing. And, I mean, Uva, you're the guy to talk about it. I know nothing of that. So, you know, uh, where to start? Well, now that we're live, I want to tell the viewers that Dan Ducci and I, we had a little five minutes to talk back and forth. That's why it looks so verklempt, like he ate a bunch of plums two hours ago, and and it's it's hitting through, and he's got to got to pass him because of some of the faces he was making in our pre-talk, and I made him wait an hour and a half because I was in a meeting. I am so sorry, Duce, but it was like an impromptu meeting. So if I would have scheduled it a week ago, it would have been different. But but you see, you see, going back to our conversation before, if you would hire a guy like me, Uva. I'd set you up properly. At 11.15, you're going in. At 11.45, you're going out, and that's it. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And let's talk about the industry because uh, this is something we were we were kind of looking, kind of impromptu thing that we were talking about. Um, and I've been talking about this for about a year, year and a half now, that what is happening to the board game industry? I mean, we're in a heyday of golden age. Um uh, games are selling like crazy. I mean, the number of games being sold is phenomenal. And so many new publishers coming in, putting their games out on Kickstarter, have successful Kickstarters, uh, making good money on the Kickstarters, beautiful games with tons of miniatures. We're in the golden hay heyday. Yeah, I, I mean, I can tell by the cars they drive. Right. So let's talk about this golden heyday. Go ahead, man. So. What is really happening to the industry? And, and if we really look at it and what we've been seeing for about a year and a half in which we we're prepping ourselves for and which we've prepped ourselves for the last year and a half uh, because we have been talking about is, is that um, I think there's going to be a big, big consolidation in the industry. You're going to see tons of businesses go out of business, get bought out or go out of business. Uh, the buyout rates, and these are all little things we can touch on, are going to be phenomenally low because uh, the um, sales multiples for a purchase price are way low, way below the average five to eight percent, um, especially in a in a industry like ours a few years ago, which was uh, the name brand of a company with all these games. Boom, you're looking at good big multiples, not like a five multiple of a utility company or something like that. So um, it, it'll be something very interesting to talk about because there is such an inundation of games and so many good games coming out of new people with great ideas putting everything, their life savings, into all these miniatures on a Kickstarter and everything. And you're saying that's a problem? Oh, a big problem, a very big problem. Because let's look at the little details. It used to be, and this is from my conversations with other publishers, with the um, distribution industry, with the reps, with um, the stores, et cetera, et cetera. On average, let's say, let's round numbers, make it easy, and say they're roughly around, let's, let's bring it half the time. Let's not say it's 6,500 games. Let's, let's take all the trash out and just make it 3,620. So that we have, well, that's how many, well, no, wait a minute, 365, 3,650 games a year, okay? That's 10 new games a day. And these are, we've already weeded out half of the crap. So 10 new games a day. Of these 10 new games, we are going to take, again, half of those out because they're good games all, but they're not great games. They're not exceptional games. So we're going to pretend the last five a day are exceptional games. So now we have seven times five. We have 35 exceptional games being released every week. And these, and I'm going to turn that around because I'm going to keep my original multiple. I'm going to, I'm going to double my 3,650 because it really is. We're between now getting close to over 7,000 games released. So I'm still going to stick with that there are roughly 30 to 35 exceptional games coming out, high caliber games. And if not high caliber, at least from designers and publishers that have a high good name recognition. Now, what about the different interests of those 35 different games? I might not be interested in uh, 
uh, a game by a certain company, this and this and that. So we're looking at the masses. We're looking now at the cream of the crop. We're looking at the top of the pile. The last, the 35 a week out of several hundred being published a week or not several hundred, maybe 200 a week. So the problem is that if there are 35 new games coming out every week, every week, now you're a, you're, you're, you're a gamer. Yeah. How many games are you going to buy a week? Uh, maybe once a month if you're a real gamer. Maybe I would say, that. Would say okay, that. If you're real. But your average gamer is going to buy a game. On average, maybe your real gamer gamer is going to buy maybe five or six new games a year. And then your, your real collectors, they could go all the way up to, let's say, 24 to 36 a year new games. That, I, that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. But let's look at the market now. Now there are 30 to 35 new games. And this is what we've talked about with our reps and distributors. These 30 to 35 games a week are now hitting the stores in America. And your buyers for these distributors are only going to buy so many games because they can't buy all 200 or 300 games that come out every month. They have to take only the best of the best because they have to pay money and they have to inventory it. And the number one thing in business that you don't want is inventory. Well, over you cycle your inventory quickly and you want to keep your inventory to a minimum. Isn't the world going online and less uh, store? It's even worse. It makes it even worse because the big distributors, the online stores, how much inventory, how many games do you think they want to, they want to keep stock of and how many weeks of stock do they want to keep now in the old days a new game would come out its lifespan would be probably nine to twelve months where people a new game came out puerto rico or a Kalis or some great game people were talking about it it would hit the stores the stores would put it on their shelves people would see it on the shelves they buy it oh we're out of that game let's order more in because it went around now i've talked and our reps are talking to us, the dealers are talking to us, the wholesalers are talking to us. You sell the hottest new game. A store buys four to six of them, which is high. Usually it's a three pack with some freebies on top of it. But the really hot ones, let's say like Batman or the, the Conan or whatever is coming out. They're going to order six of them. They get them in and five of them sold out that first week. No, let's say all six. And then the next week, the buyer calls and says, hey, check out these six new or these 36 new games that just came out this week. Man, this is hot. This is hot. This is hot. You got to get this, this, this. Well, we got you ready at $600 here. Uh, you want to buy the game you got last week, another three of them? It'll be only 200 more bucks. You're up to 800 bucks. The store owner's going, your average store owner's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got to get out of these 36 ones. I want to get at least five of these because that's what's hot in demand right now on Board Game Geek and on the internet. I'm going to go for those. I don't have money for those other ones. Unless someone comes and prepays me, not going to happen. So now the life of a new game release, three to five weeks on average, where it's hot. Three to five weeks. So what is then your what is the countering to that? And this drives me nuts because I hate it because I want to do um, the green tree type of games that have a long life, a long tail to them. But no, now the, the philosophy is put out a new game every month or every two months. Put out new games, new games, new games, new games, because they have such short lives. We're going to do shorter runs. Um, we're going to put out the new games, and then when they sell a new game, well, maybe they'll buy some of our old ones with them. And now all of a sudden, they're pumping out more and more games. And that was a big thing about a year and a half, two and a half, three years ago, where they're putting out the main publisher. And I'm even seeing it in the wargaming industry. Look at some of these companies. They're putting out new stuff every two months. And these are small companies. And the big companies are doing it. And they're just flooding the market. But unfortunately, what's happening now is you have a new person coming in with a brand new Kickstarter. 
and they're putting in this beautiful miniatures. It's a beautiful game. They're they're pumping money in. Not that many people know them. They'll get maybe fifteen hundred to two thousand backers. They earn their hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Yeah, hundred and seventy thousand dollars. I've had two companies approach me in the last month with Kickstarter successful Kickstarters they had. They're going bankrupt. Well, I, I don't understand how they can go bankrupt if they've reached their goal of let's say it was it's a hundred grand and they make a hundred and sixty grand. So okay. they've netted they've netted a good thirty five. Okay, let's look at that then. 160 grand you've earned. Out of that, that's why I like writing when I'm doing it. Let's say we have 160 grand. We're going to lose roughly around with the marketing we had to do, with the credit card fees, with the 5% from Kickstarter, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go with our percentage that we found is on average 11% are our overhead costs. That's, so marketing, gonna... that's marketing Kickstarter uh, gas. Exactly. The fact your your Facebook, whatever you did to have to make this successful. Okay, eleven percent. So we are at one sixty. That's probably quicker to do in my head, but times point eight nine. Yeah, so now know. we're down to we're one hundred forty two thousand. Right. Now those miniatures, these beautiful two inch miniatures coming out with all these other little miniatures and all that. Thirty thousand in mold feeds. Okay. Normally a little. 28 millimeter you can probably get two of them three of them but they're getting very complicated nowadays but two or three of them will usually cost you around between four and a half and seven thousand a mold okay for each mold but the bigger ones are getting much more expensive there you put more money into them yeah but you fa you factored in your cost when hold you on. hold on <clears throat> this is the problem this is what you're talking about is a problem most people have so now i'm going to take off let's be nice and say we only have twenty-eight thousand mold fees so I'm going to subtract my 28000 in mold fees. And I'm talking about these online Kickstarters, new people with tons of really neat minis coming in because that's what sells nowadays. Now we're down to 114000 These games now, to mold them and everything, on average, because they got 50 or uh, for 160000 let's say they got their 1,500 backers, because on average a game like that with all the add-ons you're averaging right around 100 to 110,000 per user. And that's what I get when I go online and look at the Kickstarters, uh, at the Kickstarter campaigns that are pretty successful. The average price is pretty high. I'm not talking about um, games like uh, those epic, you know, Gameland games like the, the uh, Tiny Epic Kingdoms and all that, where they have a lot lower price, like a $30, $35 price. But guess what? Their average sales is also around $45, $50 bucks because people are buying add-ons. But they're selling to 4,500, 5,000, 6,000 backers because they've got a good backing rate in there. So all of a sudden, we're down to $114,000. Now, let's say on with all these miniatures, they're going in. They're not buying tons because here's a problem. Let's say I'm going to buy 4,000 copies. 4,000. With all these um, uh, mold costs, the STL processing costs, making the, the demo copies, back and forth shipping, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say 4,000 of them. We're going to buy 4,000 copies. And of those 4,000, let's say a game like that's going to cost us $16 to $18. I'm not talking average board game, war game, which is just counters and paper maps and all that that costs you seven dollars to print and i can sell for 50 no i'm talking with all the miniatures the nice molded um trays etc go ahead I, I know some companies that sell them for 115 okay well let's we'll, we'll put that number in also so all of a sudden now i have my cost are sixty four thousand dollars so right now i'm down to fifty thousand dollars Now, with my $50,000, I have to ship this stuff all over the world to wholesalers. We just got in, uh, and these are pretty big games, 4,000 of a decent game that they're selling nowadays. You know, it's a few containers. We just got in. Um, our last shipment was, I think, hey, Kari, how much was our last container shipment costs? $27,000. Uh, per container? No, for the for the four containers we got in for these games. 
Okay. How many containers was there? I'm sorry. That was three containers. Three containers. That didn't include the road freight. Oh, and that did not include factory. that did not include the road freight then from the port out west to the distribution centers, which was another like six or seven thousand dollars. Now, luckily, we use rail train and it, it brings the cost down. But then we have to send them to all the wholesalers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, let's say that 50,000. Now, that's only coming to America. Now I've got to ship stuff either by rail or by ship to Europe. I've got to ship by ship containers to Australia. I've got to ship now to my Chinese distribution. I have to now ship to America. I may have to ship to Brazil to get South America going because nowadays worldwide, if you tell someone in Australia or England, well, sorry, we don't ship to you, they're going to just bash you so bad. Or you say, oh, it's not Euro friendly. So you're shipping now to Europe. You're shipping your games in. This is what most people miss. You're bringing your games in, and guess what? It hit customs. Who owes 19% VAT, the customer or you now, bringing it in? You do, my friend. So that shipping cost you thought was all okay going to Europe, boom, they're going to pop you 19% VAT tax. Where are we at now? Um, right now, we are at 50000 We're bringing the stuff in, and let's say we're going to just go with our costs, our, our mold, our, our printing cost, claiming that going into Europe. So, and let's say I'm only doing, let's say half of it. So 32,000 times 0.19. So um, that's another six grand plus my shipping, another three grand, I'm another nine down. So I'm roughly around 41,000. Now. One or 41? 41,000. Now, all of a sudden, I've got to ship this everywhere. Now, let's say, like your average miniature nice game nowadays, packaged in a box, it's anywhere between 8 pounds and, let's say, keep it low, 10 pounds, 8 to 10 pounds. So we're going to say somewhere around uh, 4 kilos, 4 to 5 kilos, okay? 4 kilos roughly is 8.8 .8 pounds. So we're looking four to anywhere between 4 and 5 kilos. Now. There are definite cut lines in costs for shipping. Number one, now you have to ship product plus extra product to your fulfillment center. So you got to go from the port, shipping it to your fulfillment center in Europe. The fulfillment center now is going to warehouse it, charge you a palletizing cost. They're going to ship it out. Now, hopefully, and most people now are, they used to build in their shipping. Now they're at least adding shipping, but they're trying to keep their shipping rates low so people don't feel screwed over again because they think if I'm in a store and I walk in, I don't have to pay shipping costs. They don't understand the costs involved to do like a Kickstarter or anything worldwide fulfilling for a company. So now let's say on average, it costs you between 12 and 18 euros to ship the game within Europe. And that includes to Norway and Sweden and people outside the EU who do not have, and don't get me wrong, I forget which countries are in the EU and which ones are part of Europe, but not in the EU, like Norway, shipping is much higher or Switzerland much higher than shipping to Austria or Germany or France or Poland. Shipping now to England is going up like crazy. So we're looking at roughly that, that amount. Most people only, charging maybe $12 for their shipping rate. So $12, like they're getting in nine euro. So all of a sudden their nine euro is turning into, they have a shipping cost of almost um, 80 to 100% higher than that because they have to pay the company counting it in, the warehousing, um, putting them on pallets if you didn't palletize it in your container, uh, getting them to put it in their computer, all the time you're spending getting all the the uh, API data transferred, uh, exported from your uh, CrowdOx, Kickstart, and everything, getting the addresses in, and then getting them shipped out. So now we're down to, let's say in Europe, we I'm going to stick with just with Europe, not even look at America, because those prices may work in America. But even UPS costs are, on average, for a game like that now, 15 to 18. So every game, you're, again, losing 6 bucks. So let's say, on average, we're only going to lose 6 bucks per game. So that includes the cost 
of your cost to hire someone to pack the games, to buy the boxes, to put them in the boxes, to bring them to the UPS or, or uh, ma uh, mail, and then all of a sudden getting these builds. In. So now I've got my um, 1,500 games times six. I'm losing another $9,000. So now I'm down to uh, $32,000. Okay. Now let's look at this a little more. So now I have all this inventory. What I, and now, this is a very successful Kickstarter, remind you. And I'm down to $32,000. What did it cost me to do the artwork for that game? How about the development? How about the royalty fees um, it, for the, the designers? Because most people are putting out these new games, either had someone come to them do it, new companies helping them, or it's a designer doing it out of his own pocket and getting this going. But usually the problem with those are is they're only earning maybe 50 to 100 grand. That's a very successful campaign for them. But then all of a sudden they're sitting there with all these costs. So now we had the art cost. We had uh, the, oh, and another thing I forgot, shipping from the printer to the port. Now you need a broker for that. I mean, put in the brokerage fees. So I'm going to puke. My point is this. For a very successful game, all of a sudden you're down to almost zero, but you still have in stock 2,500 copies because you printed 4,000. 2,500 copies. Yes, I have 2,500 copies. How are you going to sell them? You got no money. You got no, well, you got still 32 grand, but you have to pay your artist. You had to live because it takes you to put out a new game. It takes you quite a few months if not a year or two to put it yeah. out okay so you got to live on this so hey no problem you got 16 grand a year to live on afford for your family and pay all your your artists to do all that so no problem i mean it'll keep the artists going electric pay and well your wife can work for you and keep you going then okay oh wait a minute you got some kids too and eh. send them to your parents house or move in with your parents so the point is, all of a sudden now you have 2,500 games in stock. Yay. Wait a minute. 20, uh, 2,500 games. I have on average maybe 216 games per pallet. And I'm paying roughly per month $15 per pallet. Huh. I have $175 some cost a month just to store them somewhere. So I'm going to pay $175 to storm. Now what? So that's where you stand. So okay. the problem is this. We can't print 3,000 copies. We now have to print, or 4,000. We now maybe want to only print 3,000 copies. But now my mold cost per copy is pretty high. Now I'm, I'm, I've got almost, almost, $8 per game in mold cost that most people don't build into the cost of the game. So now I'm going to sell them to stores directly. I'm going to make my 50%. So I'm saying, all right, it cost me $18. I'll bring it to $25 and sell for, you know, we're MSRP it for $80 or whatever. Now the stores want them for $40. If you're going through the wholesalers, you're going to have to sell them then for $36. But you have to pay all the shipping, everything else. By the time you're done, you're going to get maybe $25, $26 out of it. Now, the problem, though, is now the dealers and distributors are to the point where so many games are coming in, they used to carry roughly four to six weeks of inventory. That means if they were selling, let's say, uh, 20 games a week of your game, they would keep in stock 80 games because they needed to make sure it kept going so that they had a month. They had four weeks worth of product of past sales. Now they're down to 14 or 14 days, two weeks. So now if you're selling, and that's a successful game, if you think through one dealer, oh, you know, I'm selling 10 games a week. Well, they're going to now stock 20 games a week. But they've got 40 stores they're worried about, or 30 publishers. Every publisher has let's say 10, 15 games in their stock, because guess what? If you only have one or two games out, 
you're not going to get carried by the distribu distribution market. Why? Nobody knows you. You only have one game out. Why are they going to waste their time keeping your account going and everything else? Too bad. You're not getting in. So the medium to bigger size companies are in, but now the buyers, they're, they're, everybody's under pressure to make money. So buyer has 20, 30 publishers that they're, uh, that, that they're responsible for. These publishers each have t uh, 10 games out with new games coming out. So they have to worry about 200 to 300 games, keeping them in the stock week to week. Well, whoa, we as humans aren't good. We don't like analyzing. So we just wait till we get the bingo. Oh, you're out of stock. Oh, shit, I'm out of stock of that game. Well, next week when I do orders, I'm going to order it. And then I get it back maybe a few days later. Guess what? That stock's now that, that game's out of stock for two weeks. So I'm in the store trying to get this hot new game I wanted. Oh, they're out of stock. Ah, shit, they're out of stock. Well, I'll wait till they get back in stock. I'll order these games instead. Well, by the time that game gets in stock, guess where their brain is? Their brain's on the other new games. So what's happening to the market? Um, I see a lot of people, a lot of companies are in, in deep financial doo-doo because the evergreen effect is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and disappearing. Companies like us in the war game market, we're lucky. We don't have as much competition, but still the pressure is on because I'm looking at some of the games coming out and corners are getting cut again slowly. Not as much time being put into the rules. Certain components getting cheaper. Um, the game not having as much depth. Oh, here, play the campaign of blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'm playing it. That was fun. Let's play thinking. Hey, I played it. That's fun. Next game. Let's, ah, uh, we played this three times already. It's always the same. And let's throw it in the corner. Oh, but they came out with a new game this month, which should have been the second scenario, third scenario on that other game. But they're forced to because the way the market is now forcing us to come out with new games to be always a new radar for the buyers, for the stores, for the online sellers. Stores, at least, would keep a game that is popular and keep it on the shelf if the owners liked it. So they'll kind of weed through and get the best of the best and keep them a little longer. The online stores, do you think they give a flying hoot what your game is? Because guess what? They're the big store selling every game in the world. They got to buy them and keep them in inventory. So their money's hung up. What are they going to hang up their money on? The new games coming out that are hot. Are they going to do it on your game that's so hot in the war game industry or whatever? No. No. So in the war game industry now, we are, a lot of them are going direct, just direct to customers. Right. How many games do you have to, how many customers can you get? How, what does your P500, how long does it take to fill that up? How long in our war game market, when you're going direct, does it take to fill stuff like that? Forever. Now, if you're going through a good distribu distribution market worldwide, you can expect coming out with a new game release, maybe for your average company, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 on your release. We're lucky. We, on our release, usually our Storm of Steel sold out in two days. And we had to reprint real quick. So our initial releases are anywhere maybe between six and 8,000 games. But still, that's nothing compared to the big sci-fi games no, no. that have releases of, they're the big hot game. It's not that they're releasing 20, 30,000 copies anymore. They're lucky if they're selling eight to 15,000. Now, you have your breakouts. You have your terraforming Mars and stuff like that. Let's not look at those. But even with, with big hits like that, a lot of companies are hurt. And how do I know this? How do I, and I've been saying this now a year and a half. Look at the market. Look who's being bought out. Look who's being sold. Look what's hitting right now on Reddit big time. Fantasy Flight Games. Now, this is nothing official. Nothing official. It's just from this conversation. Um, this is just what we're reading on Reddit. People mm -hmm. let go let the rest left and right. Um, the supposedly, and this is just what let go employees are saying, is that for example, uh, Asmodee USA owns, you know, or Asmodee owns Fantasy Flight Games, that um, they've let go of their interactive people and most of, if not all, of their RPG people gone. 
What's going to happen with all those RPG games? How about all those interactive games, everything going on? Overall, 30 to 35% of the people were let go, including people in Asmodee USA. And uh, they're canceling, uh, canceling up, upcoming projects. Because guess what? Even the big boys, the big boys that are controlling the market, that own sellers of Catan, they own all these big branches, and they're great people. They are the sharpest people, literally the sharpest people I know on the market. They're phenomenal. I've talked with them. I work with them. They are sharp people. They know it. But no fault to their own. The industry is backlashing because of the numbers. Now, where we we're very analytical engineering types, we've seen this coming. We're bunkering down. We're we got pounded by our 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 one of the games we came out with. I'm not going to mention names. They had to get sold out and let everybody go in their marketing sales department, which hurt us, which we weren't expecting. And that was a huge brand name name brand. Um, luckily, we have lots of reserves that we weathered this 300,000 plus in inventory we brought in and sold worldwide because it was a big seller for us, even with Kickstarter and all, but still, and non Kickstarter coming out, but even what we have going through the next few months. So the industry is very interesting right now. And as I say, Kickstarter is no longer a place for new designers. Now, wait, hold on, uh, Uva, before I forget, going way back to your Kickstarter, 160000 Now, the reason why they didn't factor all these percentages in could be out of ignorance or could be they didn't factor it in because the cost of the game would have been too high to sell. Um, no. Number one, most likely they don't know the numbers. They're not finance people. They're not – they're – Game designers. Right, right. They're artists. There are people who are engineers. There are people who are um, software people. They're smart as hell because the games are putting out are phenomenal. Yeah. The art, the looks, incredible. Now, these are the cream of the crop. So you're saying these guys didn't do their due diligence? Um, no, they were hoping and going by historical data that said this type of game will sell a million dollars. And it's not happening because all these million-dollar games that used to sell a lot, there's so many of them now hitting the market. How many more games am I going to buy? And all these people have been buying all these games. It's now getting to critical mass. So I'm seeing a critical mass. So now it the important thing is how do we, as a publishing company, concentrate on evergreen games, concentrate on games that will have longer lives and that's why we've for years been working on games like educational games like freedom 1775 and long series so is that your strategy and i've said that for years if you get series going things like that your your tail is three times longer yeah but your series like um your, your freedom um that that wasn't a series. That's a single game. We yeah. haven't come out with the second game. We're working on the second game in the series, which is, you know, the the looking at from the Native American standpoint in the Ohio Valley and everything during the American Revolutionary War. And it's the American Revolutionary War, all those people leaving, trying to get the freebies and the genocide that went on in the Ohio Valley with the Indian tribes and all that. So you're playing the Indian tribes and the bad boys, like in Freedom, where it was slave catcher and slave institution is what Daniel Boone and his people were doing illegally crossing over the mountains because that was English laws that were set in account. But the genocide that went on, and we we're working with the native councils and everything, they're so excited. They're so great to work with. So this is a game we're not advertising or anything because I've learned now, Uva, don't put out too early because, unfortunately, we take a long time to put out games because we need the games to be perfect. Well, unfortunately. that sounds like... That sounds like a very happy family Saturday night game, Uva. Oh, it's look at Freedom. I think is a phenomenal game. Okay, wait, 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 wait. It depresses you, but it's a phenomenal game. No, obviously, yeah, depressing, obviously. But Freedom was that 
Uva, was that a stroke of luck or was that actual planning ahead when you said like you were you're working with the Aboriginal Council or or, or whatever the people that the Native you Native American, with? yeah, the, the Indian councils and Shawnee Councils and all uh, that. Do the same thing with freedom? Oh, with freedom. Oh, yeah. We had we, freedom was very difficult because even just the cover, and I've I've done other videos on that. The covers we had to do four times with Stephen Pashal, our artist who who does incredible work, to show the 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 value, the the the, the stress and the sacrifice that the black slaves, the blacks were making to just leave everything they knew and risk their family and their lives going ahead and their own self initiative and worth and the whole underground railroad and what it took. And to bring that across, we did four paintings and every single one, we just felt it didn't bring it across. And we put it out to many people. I was in contact with very many well-known black authors out there on history because the problem is a lot of the history that we learn in class is totally whitewashed. Yes, of course. Whitewashed is made to make history look good. Yes. And there is also total um, different type of histories out there. So we try to stay very neutral, bring everything out as, as good from all the different perspectives, because you always have to try to stay neutral. But getting away from that, that game took us over two years working with Brian Mayer to get it just right. And, and the way we do the, the long cycle, emotional cycles, the short dopamine cycles, we've got that pretty much now down to a, an art. Now, but, Uva, how did you get that game, that, that philosophy into white schools? You know, it's so funny because often we'll have a teacher or principal calls and say, hey, we've had teachers requesting this. and we're like in Pennsylvania, is it okay for us to use that game? And we're like, yes. And we have a, a list, you know, we give then we to the schools, other schools have got them, uh, community centers. Um, and now that the wall, and we changed the entire cover of Freedom Underground Railroad in the last print run because of these issues that we were having. People are going to stores, getting incensed, who know nothing about what the game is about and going, how dare you guys make a game about slavery? And the counterpoint is, how dare you ignore what slavery should have taught us? Yeah, well. Oh, you ignoramus, you're going out there yelling about a game about slavery that's trying to teach you about the evil <coughs> and all the incredible people who went about to abolish it. And then you are living the life the way you are, mm. saying that you're – anyway. So, Take it easy. Take it easy. Well, anyway. So uh, very good, very, very good um, – you know, a very good uh, movie or a series that I'm watching right now, I'm only halfway through, so I don't know what's going to happen. But I tell you, at the first five episodes, I'm hooked. It's called Messiah. It is phenomenal. It is either Netflix. coming of Jesus or total international plot to bring down the American structure. Phenomenally done. Okay. Messiah on Netflix. Watch it. I saw it. I saw the, uh, the 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 ad. You know what? It is so well done. It is anyway. But getting away from that off. Mm. So now look at the industry because I don't want to get off target. Right, right, right. Um, so the problem is, let me turn off my bone. I got these uh, beautiful, so I can hear better. A uh, bone conducting earphones. Love them. Um, but. When you're running or working out or swimming, you can still hear everything. And really? you hear everything because it goes through your bones. And you can still hear traffic and everything else going on. So oh, okay. um, great. When I'm at shows, you know, can talk to people. You're not yelling loud, you know, when you have them in your ears. Okay. Anyway, so um, what we're seeing now is with the, with the industry now, because there's so such an inundation on it, now the Kickstarters, which was meant for new people being able to come out with new game and, and making something incredibly new, you're now required to have almost a finished game or have a finished game with all the artwork done to make it look good, a great video, miniatures, the STL files at least. And STL, for those that don't know, STL is a 3D image where you can turn it, see it from all angles, and that STL file is then made to in China, usually they make a 3D um, print of it. And from that 3D print, they then make 
lost cast type of mold castings to make the miniatures, and then they make the molds. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, STL files now, they cost a few hundred dollars each to make. After your artist, you pay them to make up the miniature. They then create it, have to make changes, blah, blah, blah. So new players coming Kickstarter, if it's not a beautiful video, you're lucky if you get twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in funding. And how are you going to pay for all that inventory coming in? So now it's companies such as us, people going, oh, why do you need Kickstarter? You know, you're established. You don't need that. You're, that's made for people coming out with you. No, because Kickstarter is the only way that you get a broad industry where people are still looking, where you're getting through a lot of the noise, where you can get people saying, hey, that looks like cool game. I'm going to support it. And you're not relying on the old classic, I'm going to put ads on BGG, Facebook, work on answering every blog in the world, be on Twitter, be on Reddit, be on BGG, Consum World, Facebook uh, messaging, messaging, emails, uh, Facebook, blogs. How the hell are we as a small company developing good games supposed to be a company when all we have to do, everybody's expecting us to answer every email within five minutes. And we have to be like me now talking here, which is very dear to me and thank you for the time but it's taking up time no i know i know Uva. we need to get out games and we're expected to have people on the phone which we do customer service kari spending all her time working with the fulfillment people oh we haven't even talked about all the people then who change and don't tell you the address change you ship them the game you're out your 18 dollars or whatever in europe it comes back to you. They charge you $11 or $15 coming back to get your game back, which you should, would have been better off throwing in the trash. And then the guy calls, bitching, oh, I didn't get my game. Well, you moved. Well, send me a new one. You sent to the wrong place. They shipped it back. You're not out any money. And then you have to ship a new game out. Guess what? You're a few thousand dollars more out. And your time, the salary you have to pay for the person to talk to this person, getting them off the wall. And then the people who constantly are back and forth. I've got uh, in uh, 1775 or in Vikings, uh, there should be, my friend had 42 Thane miniatures. Well, yes, sir, you're supposed to have to four, but we told the printer put in two extra in case they miscounted. So if they miscounted, usually they only miscount one or two. So you got your 40. Luckily, it was, you know, we told them always put two extra. Well, if you said 42, there should be four. I want 42. Well, no, you don't understand. You're supposed <laughs> to have 40. We put two free extra in just to make sure you had 40. Well, yeah, my friends all have four. I want four. And then they go online. Jesus, Pete. And, you know, those people don't go away. And that's another three, four hours you're wasting on this goddamn two little miniatures, which cost me, you know, at, at, after tax, $20 an hour. I'm 80 bucks out in time. And then finally, sir. Go to hell, but you can't say that. And then do you lose a customer? Unfortunately, those type you never lose. <laughs> they just like bitching. But it takes time, effort, everything else. So you can see where the industry is going. It's the money it takes to run a good business and to make it all efficient. Do you now just say, I'm going to step back and only sell direct? Or do I go through distribution where I'm only getting 34% of MSRP? Going direct, you have to do shorter print runs, 1,500, 2,500. Going worldwide like we do, you got to do print runs of at least, you know, six to 10,000 opening up and then keep it going. But the risk, what if a game doesn't sell? Then I'm stuck with all that inventory, what you do with it. Well, then you're going to dump it. But even dumping it doesn't help your company. So you go to conventions and all these free games people give away free. Mm. Wow, that company is so nice. Look, they're giving free games. You yeah, think they're giving you their best sellers? Sorry, I don't think so. <laughs> no. A market analysis of where we are, and I think you're going to see a lot more in the coming year. You're going to see a lot of people go out of business. You're going to see a lot of conciliation, consolidation, because it's better for two companies to work together and only have one accounting system, et cetera. I'm working with companies now, left and right, where we're doing shipping together. We're doing show shipments together. We're beginning to um, help each other out, different shows we go to. How many shows can I go to? You know, last year at Gen Con, we have a, a, um, a 20 by uh, 30 booth. So we had a 
six booth area in one spot. And then we had, they gave us another 80 by 100 uh, foot area where we had 20, I think, two or 24 people, volunteers that were giving free games and stuff for, free tickets and all, running games. Just to get people playing the games, coming, buying the games, to be where we were years ago in sales. Because when you go to a show like that and you're paying $6,000 for your booth fees, for the support, so your name gets up there, so you get the placement that you want. Um, by the time you're done, you're great, you're happy, you're breaking even. Yeah. But you're not putting in the month and a half you had to plan at getting all the volunteers, the talking, blah, blah, blah. Now, Uva, um, you, you, you now, today's a good day. I'm feeling good. That's why I'm all pumped up. Yeah, you got me all stressed out. <laughs> Anyways, well, well, but you understand where the industry is coming from. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to throw up. I, 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 hold on, Uva. I got a few questions here. Bloody hell. Um, so a company like yours, you have freedom, which is a staple. Yes, luckily we sell that after seven years. It is still selling every month. Okay, is there any other games that are staples as much as Freedom in your company? Uh, Freedom's our lowest staple game. Our oh, seventeen seventy five okay. game. Our um, uh, Conflict of Heroes continues. We reprint Conflict of Heroes every year. Now, our older games like our Awakening the Bear and all that, I only print like three thousand a year now. But the damn game's already 11 years old. Okay. Really? Now, luckily, with the new reprint third edition, a lot of people are upgrading to third edition because it's a totally new game. People go, why the hell? You're screwing us over, changing the rules. And that's why you're trying to make it. No, you don't have to buy third edition. We're giving you the free rules online. We're doing all this. Take a 10 center, mark it up. Yeah. It's free. If you want to do it that way, or you can just buy the dice when they're in stock. Mm -hmm. um, but with that series, we haven't put that much out because we're we have so many games that it took us a long time to get where we're happy with. But now we have several new series that are going to we're going to be introducing. But it's always series. And now let's talk the next thing. And wait, I know wait, we're talking a lot. Talk wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. Um, so either you're 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 lucky or you were smart in planning this. Um, or business. It's my eighth business, so I, I'm lucky there. That I, I'm lucky that I understand business. Right, right. Well, lucky. You're, you're smart that you understand business, whatever. A lot of it's luck. I tell you what, I made a lot of mistakes where I lost a lot of money. So, Uva, um, basically, you're losing money on certain games, but you're you're making money on other games. So there's a break-even factor happening, right? I've only lost money on one game. So what are you bitching about? I'm not bitching. I'm giving a talk here of what's happening in the industry. Oh, sorry, sorry. You want to talk about my company? That's no, a talk no, no, no. NASA. <laughs> okay? I'm okay. okay I Listen, if I'm a guy who's going through the shitter like that, you think I'm the one who's supposed to be giving this talk? Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, right. just telling, I'm just giving people how I see the industry going. I've said a year and a half ago, now things are happening. Mia culpa, mia culpa. I, I, I'm ADD, man. I, I, I branch off. That's why I have to go work out every day. That's why, you know, I, I try to stay my college weight because if I don't, you're going to go crazy. You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to do all kinds of blood. <laughs> People give me shit because I said, Gunta, why are you vegetarian now? I said, you know what? When I'm doing like 50 soccer games a month and a half, you know, tournament, high school and college games, at my age, I'd be I'd be dying. My my knees were hurting and everything. So you got it. You got to just go through the pain and everything else. But it's uh, you got to learn to go on a little sleep. That's for sure. I wake up so many mornings at three in the morning. I woke up this morning at three in the morning. Couldn't sleep anymore. And on with the Chinese because we had fifteen pallets get lost in Europe going to a fulfiller. Not the fulfiller's problem. It was just because of Christmas. It got where was it between Rotterdam. And Germany, we were told it was delivered on the 19th. It wasn't. So I'm on there. Luckily, with the Chinese, our American uh, um, uh, mid-Atlantic uh, mid uh, mid transit. No, that's not for real. My friend, I'm going to tell you some stuff to eat and bring that blood pressure down. Um, hey, after we're, after we're done, are you on your phone or are you on a, on a camera? 
No, no, I'm on the computer. On the, uh, oh, you should. Let's next time we'll get you a little with the handy cam. And while we're doing these interviews, you're out there running. No. <laughs> <laughs> you need a dog. You have a dog? Yes. Yeah. I, I've heard this before. Please. Yeah. I tell you what, dogs. They're pure love. I know. I'm. I'm. Look. I'm out of shape. It's. It's not mushroom time. When it's mushroom time, I'm out in the forest and I'm doing this. But now it's winter here, man. It's. Uh, anyway. What kind of dog do you have? Do you have like a border collie that every two hours is nipping you, telling you, Gracie, go outside? Gracie, come. Oh, what a cute dog. So anyway, let's go with now. The last thing. Let's look at your designer. What's happening to designers now? Um, in the old days, the big names and all that, the designers, they had the market. They could put out a game with their name. I'm seeing it's not happening anymore. You know, you get the big name designers in average game, Euro game, stuff like that, because there's so much new crap coming in, and it's all visual now. It's a Kickstarter with the 3D video imaging and all that. All of a sudden, you had a designer had some very good games. Yes, he will have a following. He will probably double your sales. But is it going to be like the old days where you're going to sell 40,000? No. How, how many games do you think sell 40,000 copies anymore a year? You're lucky if it's 20. You know, name me 20 games that were the runaway hits of last year. Easy to do. But after that, a very successful game sells 15, 20,000 copies. Oh, he's turning off his volume. So, so now let's look at the last thing. And I know we're talking way too long. No, it's fine. It's fine. But yeah, you'll edit it all out. But let's now oh, look at live. <laughs> oh, okay. So now let's look at the um live. So we can't edit anything out. So I have to be very careful. Yes. I say here. Okay. Um oh, the only people I can make fun of is Germans. So you could uh But anyway, um uh, I had to think of a word that was not uh a curse word in Germany. And it it didn't come out very well because the only the only insults we have are just very nicely flamboyant. Usually, anything to do with feces and and animal parts. Schweinehund. What's it? Yeah, Schweinehund. Yeah, genau. Or the Ashgeiger or whatever. You know, you ass fiddle you. You know, you're talking out of your anyway. So, um, anyway, now let's look at the designers. Now I'm a company. In the old days, designers, um, a big standard was. I'm going to give you the rights to my game for two years, and then I get the rights back. Okay. Or I'm going to give you the rights so long, and if the sales aren't any more that good, I'm going to get the rights back. And what's he going to do, go shop somewhere else? Well, that's what it happened in the past. And a lot of designers still think that that's the standard average. Not a must. That Because why would I, and we're saying a lot of agreements, and there's so many good games coming to us. Unfortunately, good games you can't sell anymore. You can't publish anymore. You can only publish incredible games because good games don't sell anymore. Yeah, you'll sell 500,000, 1,500. It's not worth your time. You know how many games we've turned off where it was complete good game where we knew we'd sell 1,500 or 2,000 of them? Eh, because we have to put all the time and effort. If we don't control the entire rights to a game, why are we going to push all the marketing, all the effort that we're putting in to build up a brand name that then someone else can go, up? Oh, your time's up. Now we're going to take this and all the brand you build up, we're going to take advantage of it and either do it directly or do it for, through someone else. Not going to happen. And I've seen a lot of companies hurt that way because now you're in trouble. You've been getting all these rights and all of a sudden you lost all the rights to your assets. What is your company worth? What is your company worth? A company is worth its net present value of the future sales of 10 years. But what is the average life of a game now? Three to five weeks? You're lucky if after a year, most of these games are still selling a dribble. And you think they're going to resell? Now, I'm a company trying to buy out your brand name. What's your company worth? Well, I did $100,000 or uh, 400,000 sales last year. What was your profit? Well, let's say. Oh, 150000 What was it after you paid yourself something? Well, 25000 Okay, 25000 profit. How much you want for the company? Well, I want twice my sales, $800,000. Well, 
if they had new games coming out, like a software company where it's a new technology or something, maybe. But their games, if their life cycle of an average game now is getting shorter and shorter, and you're lucky if it has a life cycle over a year, how many games of a popular game or war game sell tons of games three years after it was published? Maybe one or two? If any? No. What happened to the net present value of 10-year valuations? It's gone. Now you got to look with your assets that I have, meaning your license, your what your values are, how much can I sell of that, of what is there? Over the next three years, if I'm lucky, I'm going to bring that net present value back of profit, and that's what I'm going to pay you. And what's that usually worth? You'll be lucky if it's worth the profit you made your last year. I'm not even going to back, go back the last three years. You have to go back the last year. Oh, you made 25000 last year. I'll give you 25000 for everything you have. And guess what? Your inventory is worth zero to me because inventory is not brought into the valuation of a company because that's just shit sitting there. I'm buying your engine. I'm buying the engine that you own that will get me more future money. So, Ufa, uh, inventory is not worth anything in any aspect of business? When you, evaluation, when you do a valuation for a company, inventory does not come into the account for net present value. In you any business. Sales. You in any, any business. Sales. Any business. If your sales, if your sales this year going for 10 years, or let's say in the next three years, we're saying you make $25,000 this year. And you make, let's say where you're growing like crazy, you're going to make 50000 next year and 100000 in the third year. Net present value to that is not going to be 100000 50000 25000 because that $175,000 that I'm going to make in profit that you want in money that I'm going to pay you, no. I've got to take my money and make profit on my money. So to make $175,000, if I took my money and put it in the stock market or in a T-bill or you average 6% or whatever with a not big beta risk in there, I'm going to say, okay, I could take over the next three years $130,000, $40,000, put it in a very safe money return, and I'm going to earn what your net present value is going to be. So let's say it's $150,000. I'm going to offer you $150,000. I'm offering you $150,000 for your future sales. What's your inventory worth to me? $150,000. What if you have $400,000 of inventory sitting in your inventory? What's your inventory and your licenses, your patents, everything worth to me? $150,000. It's the engine because that 150000 takes into account buying new product, selling the product, the margins, everything else. That's what you're buying. That's what people get wrong. Inventory, you want to minimize your inventory. That's why a lot of people, when they do a sale, they do an, an asset sale also for the buildings and everything. But nowadays, companies, they're not buying your building. You bought a building. My company has this building. I don't give a shit about your building. I don't want your building. Keep paying your 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 next 20 years that you have paid because nobody's going to buy your damn building nowadays because it's a big warehouse building. They're dime a dozen nowadays. Who's going to buy it? It's worthless to me. So now Uva, worthless to me. So I'm buying Uva, your net present value of future sales. So Uva, um, obviously at the beginning, uh, the this, this, this conversation is about, uh, uh, saturation of board games, oversaturation of yes. board games. Now, what's, I know you're saying a few companies are going to shut down or they're going to be bought out. Bought out is probably the best thing for them for them to keep their business, I guess, but they're going to lose employees. Um, oh, you're going to fire all the employees. You don't need the employees. So how long How long is this going to be lasting? Uh, if you could think, if we had a crystal ball. Well, it, it's hard to tell because... Um, the board game industry is still in the growing phase. Um, you have all these super gamers that are slowly beginning to back off. They're selling their old games, buying new games. Yes. But the market is growing quickly. All these college kids are now playing more and more games. They're getting into games. The gaming market is still, in, I think, in its infancy blooming. Um, it is still at its bud. So there's still a lot of growth. You look at Hasbro, how it's growing. Um, 
the stock for Hasbro and and Mattel and stuff like that. I don't know Mattel. I haven't been following, but Hasbro has been doing very well with the stock market. Their profits, everything. Yeah, but they own everything. Pardon me. They own everything. Well, all the cheap the Ameritrash games, yeah. Um, but they have good margins, but they're being pushed down. You know, you look at a game now. I'm finding Monopoly for thirteen dollars. Yeah, I know, I know. You know, ten years ago they were nineteen dollars, and the dollars devalued, and so. The margins are getting very tight, um, and there are ups and downs and everything. Right now, the economy is doing very well. Everybody has jobs. If the economy should take a turn, luckily, the gaming industry is an industry where normally people will not buy a new car. They won't buy a new house. Maybe they won't go on the flamboyant vacation, but guess what? They'll get their hair cut, and they're going to buy games still, not as many. So I think what's going to happen is – you're going to see a winnowing out of a lot of companies that are not very efficient. You're going to take the big companies are going to cut off a lot of the crap and really concentrate on certain lines, on big margins. Uh, worldwide distribution has to get better. Certain companies are going to crop up that are going to become worldwide domination. Um, Amazon is going to start dictating more and more stuff. How can get you get your games in Amazon and then have the fakes not not get you out? Amazon just made a huge announcement. You know they're going after the fake people. They're suing them, cutting off their accounts. Was in the news this week. Um, so, do you continue with distribution? Are you concentrating on Amazon, giving half your money away to Amazon, and they're cutting your costs or the game costs so that stores can't support you anymore? Or do you say, screw that, I'm going to ignore Amazon. Oh, I go on myself, but then you're way below your game is on page five. Like I look for some of our games because we try to keep our prices high on Amazon. And because we don't play Amazon's game and undercut and try to be the lowest price on the market, you put in like Freedom Underground Railroad, you don't find us. We're out of stock unless you go to page four and there you see all our Freedom Underground Railroad. What you'll find before Freedom Underground Railroad, you'll find the You'll put Freedom Underground Railroad board game, and on page two and everything, you'll find helicopters, the Freedom Fighter helicopters, and everything else other than that because those are playing by the games. So more and more companies are going to be forced to go into the Amazon route or with the big discounters or something. is what's And that's a totally dis different discussion. What's going to happen to the brick-and-mortar stores? We're doing everything we can to support brick-and-mortar stores, but many companies aren't. What's going to happen if the Pokemon and the the Magic uh, Magic the Gathering, which is their blood and staples, if that should turn out? So what I talked about and where I'm giving the predictions, you're going to see a lot more companies start going down the drain. You're going to see a lot of the everybody wants to be designer coming out. Those days of easy, low barrier are getting lower and lower. You're not going to make the fortunes. It's going to hard, be hard to establish yourself in a set company like we luckily did 11 years ago because we were at the infancy and we were lucky. We weren't in this overabundance yet. Um, you're going to see designers not be able to retain the rights to their games. Because the company has... Because we can't. We cannot take on the risk yeah i understand you have a great game you came up with a great game i want to retain all rights or i came up with a great game i'm, I'm selling to you i want to retain all rights you know if you don't do so many sales i get back and i'll go to your competitor well what the hell do you have the incentive to go through all the risk of the molding no i understand i understand doing the marketing worldwide right now we have through alliance we um on meeple magazine we were um i don't know what we have we had in November or October, no, November, we were on the front cover. You figure, you know, if we're on the front cover of the national magazines, we would, uh, I'd keep them. And those are the ones I'm not interested in, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot believe that I don't have any, they sent me a bunch of magazines. Oh, unbelievable. I'd storm the steel on the front of every Meeple magazine nationwide unbelievable of course you know but you know to put we were on the front cover of meeple magazine in november 
We are on the back cover um, of the magazine with Agents of Mayhem in in, Feb in December. We're in going for the brick and mortar stores. We're in the five, 350 biggest brick and mortar stores with the light panel advertisements uh, going in to get people interested. Sending out, we didn't go through those costs, shipping out free copies to all the, the sellers, to the major uh, ally, uh, um, distributors. Sending out free copies worldwide to reviewers. You know, we send out between 50 and 60 copies worldwide, mm -hmm. plus shipping costs. Mm -hmm. Shipping from America to Europe cost me, or to England cost me $70. You know, so um, we're going to, it's going to get tighter. Brick and mortars, don't know what's going to happen. I think the good ones are going to flourish. Uh, the cafes, the way that that trend is going, they're not going to go away. But the little guys, in those grungy little stores that specialize in certain games, gone. Um, gaming is going to keep on flourishing. Designer is going to get tighter. Uh, Kickstarter is not going to be as profitable as it was in the past. Uh, new designer is going to have a harder time getting into industry unless they uh, ally themselves with a publishing company. And when publishing companies like us, when we're working with a designer, we want to work with that designer a long time. So we're going to treat them well, but... Um, oh, and designers, be very, very careful. Never, well, I'm not going to say never. Um, I shouldn't even go into that because maybe other companies are doing it. They're going to curse me for it. But I never pay royalties on profits. Because if anybody knows accounting and finance and all that, profit's just an arbitrary number. Uh, you can make a profit or you can lose a profit. Uh, you can, you know, it, you, you have a, as a, a, as a business, you have a big uh, movement of how you can book stuff for the net profit to pay a a um a designer so we always go off of net sales we give a number every sold game we sold boom that's how much you get if we lose our asses at a show guess what you're making your money um so that's i i highly recommend always work off that way Uva, uh, this is probably going to be a stupid question, okay? Because I know nothing of business. Now, um, an established company, okay? This is really live. Wow. Okay. I'm well, glad we're not taking questions. Oh, you're taping it. Good. Well, no, I, I, I'm trying to get questions. And for some reason, chat, I, I, I don't know. I'm a little bit new at this. I know yeah. it's live on my chat. You got it on private chat instead of live comments. I have it on private chat? Yeah, I just turned it to live comments. So let's go on then. Uh, I, on my right hand side, there is a. I've got the thing where it says private chat or live comments, and we've been on private chat the whole time. Oh uh, no, I've been on live. I've been on chat. Okay. I don't know. And it's, uh, someone look. There's 24 people watching. Someone writes something, anything. Uh, how pretty Uva is at the moment. Actually, Uva, Uva's in great, great, great shape. He runs all the time. I don't know where he's running to, but he runs all the time. And the guy's an animal. Border collies. Gracie. She doesn't want to get here. Could someone on chat write something so I can? <laughs> What's going on here? Look, I'm going to write something. Hi, uh, Uva. YouTube doesn't support comment on private private videos. What does that mean? Hold on a second. I'm, I'm going to my channel now. And it says live now. And. Oh, man, this is happening on YouTube. <laughs> oh, guys, I'm so sorry. Um, bloody hell. Um, ah, so I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the Devin, Devin, the original Grognard. If you're still here, can you email me, write something, how to get this chat happening? You know. Anyway, but we should have done this the first five minutes, right? Wow, well, we were talking about stuff. There you go. Um, okay, Uva. Now, uh, going back to your your uh, to my question, uh, the stupid question. Now, an established company, if they cut out a lot of the middlemen, we'll start with printing. How insane is that? Oh, they print their own stuff? Yeah. You know, I've had a lot of good discussions with people who do that. Um, 
they are a they're very horizontal company you know they're doing oh wait a minute is it a vertical company or horizontal um they they believe in controlling every portion of their market of their product and that's one way to go about it um i disagree with that wholeheartedly that you be uh, you, uh, buying printers for yourself no I, I disagree with that um i believe that you should concentrate at what you're good at because the other part is worth dime a dozen for other people to do that have consolidated with many different other customers they're much more efficient you're not putting in uh tying up your money in inventory for that stuff and um i i feel people are going to go that way aren't going to last long So, if, if I had a lot of cash, and I'm not talking about any company in general, that's just in general. My philosophy is I never believe in when I had my steel companies, I didn't have my own forging presses. I used Schilling Forge, who had hundreds of customers, and I got my forging. I specialized in what we were good at. We developed new steels, we developed new meta steels. What we did with the hardening, with laser hardening, and all that was cutting edge. That's what we were good at, and that's why we dominate the market in that industry. Um, so in this industry, what are we good at? We're good at uh, creating new AI systems, what Gunta's doing. Um, we we're, we're, we're have a knack for putting out games, and we have also a knack with, with being on good terms with most people in the distribution industry. Well, I should say almost everybody. We, we really don't have – we have pretty good uh, um, interfacing with people. So from that standpoint, um, we concentrate what we're in. I don't even want to run my own warehouses, even though, you know, we've got a 22,000 square foot building here and we've got full of pallets. We had people coming through the other day going, Jesus Christ, you guys have a lot of stuff here. And, um, I didn't say that. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to offend anybody. Um, but, uh, uh, highly good shice of that, man. Um, uh, but we don't we don't try to ship anything through here. We just keep enough in case there's emergency things we have to get out. But I don't want to have warehouse people. I don't want to. That's what people are there for with fulfillment houses. They specialize in that. Um, and they've taken like we're working now with R and R uh, games who have gotten distribution in in um, Fort Wayne going, and they've got a beautiful setup, very sophisticated, very automated. And um, we're now moving stuff over there because why should I hire someone? They hire someone when they have someone that can do all of our products together. So why should I print? Why do I want to be a printer? I can get stuff printed so cheap. Why, why have to train people, have million dollars of printing operations here, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we have shrink wrap machines. We have laser cutters here, but that's for development. So um, I believe in a carry. We don't have many people here, Abba. Um, what is it when you control all aspects of a business? Is that horizontal or vertical? I'm sorry? When you're vertical, you oh yeah. When you're vertical, you control all aspects of your product development. Horizontal, you just do one little aspect on it and relying on other people. So I think we're more horizontal. We just do the board gaming, we let other people do the shipping, other people do the printing. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Yes. Take them. <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> so Dan, yeah, you're still trying to figure out how to get this thing going. Yeah, right? I, I want I want to apologize to the people. I've got 24 people probably asking a lot of good questions, and uh, I'm here asking stupid questions like, why don't you buy printers? Um, give me a second, just one second here. Devin is working with me. He's asking me why. Why is the worst question to ask someone? Why? Because um i go uh, devon i go on it says public now i want to save the changes and it says an error occurred on youtube this is usually temporary wait a moment then try again i've been trying all this time anyways so uva you there yes um you, you, it's not very hopeful what you said there in an hour and 14 minutes. Oh, no, it's very hopeful. Uh, it's the very hopeful. Doing it right. The companies are doing it right. We're planning. They're going to become more and more powerful and um, 
more and more ingrained, they're gonna they're gonna survive this this influx. Um, how long do you think this is gonna be? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we've let uh, people go. We're not hiring certain people. We decided not to go heavy the marketing route. We are going 100% production development. The people we've put on, uh, we've put on um, three more people in the last few months just from the standpoint of product development, project management. We're working a lot more with, uh, with the printers now. The printers are seeing it's getting harder for them. I think the Chinese government has um, built a lot of factories for a lot of these printers outside of the belts of Shanghai. Um, we were working with one printer. They were between the first and second belt in Shanghai. And I guess it was made illegal to be a printer in this segment of Shanghai. So the ones who were outside of those belts had no problems. These guys had to move. But man, six months later, they had a brand new huge factory built four hours drive from Shanghai. Beautiful, huge, just big facilities. That doesn't happen to a printer without, you know, I think heavy Chinese support and, and building infrastructure, which is a really, you know, smart thing to do in a, in a type of country like that to get it going. Um, I don't know how much that would work in America where it's where more of a Republican type of uh, laissez faire industry. So, um, but it, it's 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 interesting to see. So even printers are right now. There's so many printers popped up, and they're all fighting for a piece of the pie. So they're giving a lot away, but they're. I've seen now more and more games, and I, I did some talks a year ago, where I saw some of the boards were all warping like crazy, and now that's kind of settled down. The 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 quality of the products is is staying up there but um even the chinese are are under high pressure to make profit and and they'll they'll bend over backwards to make your game good but you also have to be on top of it and and dictate everything i've got uh, i've actually opened up another window so i can see uh, uh the comments and one comment id jester he's a he's a regular uh, youtuber play uh, play tester uh, playthrough guy and he says, uh, special, specialization is key. Do what you're good at and do it better than any other guy. Perfect. <laughs> you're right. So, yeah, because you, I know you can't do everything. You can't do everything. So you know what? Hold on a second, ID Jester and, 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 and Uva. I specialize <clears throat> in my family tree. In my family tree, Uva, believe it or not, we were jesters. You capish? I'm not surprised. Right, because because I'm such a clown. I didn't say you're kidding me. No, I no, I believe that. Yeah, we were jesters, and 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 <clears throat> I guess of this long tradition of being a joker type guy. But you know what? I'm good at being a clown, ID jester, and I, I do stuff a lot better than a lot of people. And here I am at home. Well, that's smart. You know, if, if I could do it um, from home, luckily we own the building and everything. I mean, it's um, it's uh, we have great advantages here also because we have I didn't come out and say, oh, I'm going to become a game designer and start to go from scratch. You know, um, if you have experience of doing something like you are very a people person yeah. and. You um, specialize in being from the psychology field and all that. Yeah. You understand how to uh, push people's buttons in a good way, and and that's that's entertaining. Yeah. So you wouldn't want to go and become a video editor because um, if you did, your background screen would look so hot. Um, <laughs> but. And, and and on that note, Uva, I am available for hire. Anyways, uh, I've well, got I said though, you know what? What is difficult, and we're, I say, right now, I am penny pinching pennies left and right. Yeah, I am right now because I see it coming. I see it coming. We have right now um, seven projects going through seven. Um, we, you know, this stuff was going to be all these miniatures were be, going to be done quite a while ago. This is for our one small step. And we didn't like how the glasses came out. So they had to totally redo the molds. Again, 
another three to four weeks. It was what 20 glasses? days. No glasses on that thing? Uh, this, uh, this uh, well, you can't see it. It's 28 millimeter. It's a uh, one of the images of one of the main uh, female engineers and in she's that, uh, the 60s. Pardon me? She's wearing glasses? Yeah. Uh, we wanted detail for people paint. You know, I won't put up with shit. You know, it's it's got to be crisp. And now they're beautiful. They totally redid the molds. Um, for example, other things that we have going on, which if I bring up an image, you can see it on the screen on my screen. Can I share a screen or not? Uh, oh, I don't yeah, your screen. I think I. Can. I don't know. You could try it. What are we? What are we? Uh, what are we working on here? What, what what program are you on? This is called uh, Streamyard. Oh, Streamyard. Okay. Yeah. Never heard of it. Here, Mister Never Before uh, in Europe has a question. Yes. Okay. What can the consumer do to maintain quality products that are niche? War games. Are there corporations going to buy everything up and then tell us what we want to buy? Now he said, the, "What can the consumer do?" Yeah, to maintain quality. Well, yeah. What can the consumer do to maintain quality products that are niche? Uh, the consumer can do crap. That's right. Nothing. I mean, literally. I mean, you know, I'm I am so mad with the crap put out in in the the not recycling and all that. I go out of my way to recycle everything. We just are re putting in all uh, LED lights throughout the whole factory here, through our whole building, and the loads where I buy them from. They're selling LED uh, um, fluorescent light bulbs, six foot or four footers, but they won't take them back to recycle. Now, see, we have nowhere to recycle all this mercury laden crap. Now, you sell me this shit, take it back. And I created a fuss. I mean, they wouldn't take it back. And then I finally talked with the, with the um, local Lowe's manager, nicest guy in the world, says, you know what? You're right. Bring them in. We'll put them with our recycling stuff. And they're recycling from out. That's what he said. I hope he's doing it. I hope it's not just going dumpster. But what can we do? Oh, we just don't buy the crap from that person. The the market, the what people expect with the computer, we you're not buying product anymore that you're going to keep for 20 years. Or if it goes bad, you take it to the local repair guy down there and it'll make it work again. If my printer doesn't work anymore, what do I do? Oh, throw the damn thing out and buy a new one for a hundred bucks. Unless. Yeah, because get it repaired, it'll cost me 150. Yeah. What? So I don't know what the consumer can do. What we what the consumer can do is be support the companies that support high-end quality stuff. Um, if I my wife is very much into that. If there's something made in China or something made in USA and the USA costs 20%, 25% more, 30% more. And they're same quality. She's going to go U.S. I understand. If it costs twenty percent more, and the Chinese is twice as good, she's going to go Chinese. I understand. You know, you go with what's good. Yeah, uh, Mister Never Before um, brought up a question to me, and you said something. Now, these little companies that make these fun little stupid games, Uva, that yeah. I like to play. Yes. What's going to happen? Oh, they're going to keep on going. I mean. There, these are very low cost, low to ship. Um, that's a totally different market again. That is a the card game markets. These little uh, boxed, uh, you know, submarine game. One of my favorites. Uh, I mean, I don't have any here, but a lot of my favorite games are little fast, good games, and and I think they're going to thrive. They're going to thrive, and that's where I think Gameland Games has done a great job with their. Tiny Epic Kingdoms, small boxes, lightweight, really fun play, cheap to ship, cheap to warehouse. You can put freaking 900 of those on a pallet instead of, you know, 200 of ours. Well, hold on. So, I've got this game here. That. Yeah, look at that, look at that piece of shit there. <laughs> I mean, how much does it weigh? Well, it weighs a hell of a lot, lot, man. I know. Yeah. Tell me about it. that's hitting the stores in two weeks. It better sell well. <laughs> now, um, there's only like three of these that can fit in a box. What's that? There's only three of these that can fit in a box. Yeah, yeah, and they're pretty heavy, exactly. And they they that takes a lot of and we 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 printed a lots and lots of them um, because we're going through worldwide distribution and all. 
And so we're hoping that does well. And the problem is war game is looking, oh, it's a sci-fi game. All that. It's, that is one of the badasses, really cool systems for tactical combat that we pulled from our Fallujah game uh, that we haven't put out to the public yet. Uh, that's a game we published with, with uh, military pers personnel years ago. And that's why Lieutenant Colonel Retired went with that company and knew about that and said, hey, let's make this game. Uh, but even there, how do you get war gamers to play a game like that, even though it's a, one of the incredible tactical, you're blowing buildings up, stuff um, like that? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm trying my best to, to try to bridge something uh, between war games and Euros on the Dice Tower. And um, Euro, Euro gamers, <clears throat> I don't know if they're as stuffy as war gamers, but war gamers, the old guys, Uva, if it ain't Hex and Counter, don't even look at me. Now, some, some Euro guys are like, war games? Don't even say the word war game. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's why we're not a war game company anymore. Uh, and you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing a video soon uh, on on the, the agents of mayhem for the um, for the dice tower. Oh, and wonderful. I wanna, huh? wonderful! Thank you. Yeah, of course, I, you you sent me the game. I gotta do something now. Anyways, uh, and I'm gonna I want to make a nice video going in and showing that because this is it's a tactical game. Yeah. Here, let me show you one of our small ones we're coming out with. Let me share my screen. Can you do that? I hope so. Let me let me know if people can see that. Let me see. Uh, screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. Um, sure. Share screen. But I don't want to show both my monitors, but let me share screen. I'm going to share this one here. I'm going to go share. I don't know how you do that if you're not the moderator. Oh, I see. I, I, I've got it on here, so I click on you it. See it now? Here you go. Now, that is a three-dimensional. This first one is a three-dimensional racing game where during the game, you all start from starting positions on one cube. You're going towards the end racing. But during a player's turn, they get to move and shift the reality of their racetrack, meaning flipping the, the cubes, moving them, crushing the other players so that they're crushed out. And, and slide. It, it's just a hilarious game of um a race game that's the first one the next one's going to be a war game 3d war game who's the designer of this one um this is uh this one was a brand new designer out of cleveland matt and we've been working with him now and and making all the cool stuff with it and then we're already working on all the derivative works on it now uh, a, a dummy like me how hard is that game uh this this we're making it 14 and over because they're magnetic. You know, everything's magnetic. So it takes about, the rules are four pages long with a lot of pictures. And there's going to be one of those really light, general, full, everybody in the industry um, type of game because it's very fun, fast. Kids will play, but we're making it 14 and over because of magnets. I'm scared as hell that some kid is going to, chew this thing up and get in the magnet inside and so we figure 14 year olds aren't going to chew and swallow magnets so uh, I've, I've got a question here from one of your comrades in 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 germany his name is jan heinemann yes so jan heinemann asks and he's got a, a show called he's got a show called let's play history and this is a this is a young good looking very intelligent german man who knew anyways yeah, the average now <laughs> so he asks, "What's what his name? Uva, what do you think about print on demand? Is it for small companies?" Um, you know, print on demand is is very popular. Uh, our customer base is mostly professionals. People work a lot. They're on on computer screens all day and all that. And um, I think print on demand used to be much more popular nowadays because we're all so busy. I'm not one who wants to go out and have all this stuff printed and sit there for hours cutting stuff out and gluing it on. And so for me, it's not the thing, but other people are very successful with print on demand and they'll sell a good 150 copies, but I'm not going to do any game for 150 copies. Now, what about, I could be wrong. I don't know if there's a print on demand game out there that sold 5,000 or 10,000 copies. I don't know. Um, and, 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 and another question, Uva, uh, this is from me this time. Um, 
there's some companies that contract their print on demand to a company who does a print on demand. I know Kevin, yeah, Mr. Smith very well and uh, very great guy and um, Steve and, and, and people like that. They, it's, it's, a, it's a great industry that's out there for to get your game out, low cost, low price. Now, um, it, the, the profits are a lot lower for the company print, subcontracting this out, man. Of course. Like quite a bit. Yeah, I think I think um, what kind of people? I mean, of the viewers, uh, you know, just look at their. Ask how many people do print on demand games, on a on a consistent basis, or how compared to buying a full done game. I, I don't know how many people that is. Uh, I don't think it's a big portion. But then again, that's my bias. That's my ignorance. I'm not familiar with print on demand games. I've, I've talked with them a lot because they want our games that we put some on there and I've refused because I don't want to dilute our print game. People get pissed off saying, God damn it. You know, you're coming out with a new edition. Uh, you're just trying to screw me over and take my money. And we're like, no, you know, if I get something better, I'm going to make the system better because for the long term of our company and everything and sales, it's the way to go. What about uh, another guy asks, uh, or a, some a commenter here? Uh, what about manufacturing in the states, Uva? We trying that all the time. We just had uh, some games manufactured in the United States. The problem with the printing industry in general in the United States, meaning from the paper manufacturing to the cardboard manufacturing and everything else is that you're getting such a, um, a demand. Now, I'm. this is my personal rhetoric. I'm a, My diatribe um, from the businesses I've had and, and my issue with corporate America right now is that they're getting a bunch of young morons in who are told that Six Sigma means saving five cents on making a product. They don't understand that Six Sigma and all these uh, Japanese type of of enhancement programs are to make continuous product better and that that is that you you can predict what the outcome is going to be so you don't have scrap you don't have to redo stuff and that's how you save money we started only printing in america the quality was crap then we went to germany the quality was great but now the chinese make the best our upcoming games here we've uh, our latest game samples i got in that we're working on the new system i've told some people online with our um with our new ai system our new uh campaign system and everything is going to be where you're doing your prep orders and these boards now oh here for example here I'm, I'm doing my prep orders. I'm doing like a commander in prep orders, doing his designing, what they're planning on doing on the board. You're doing it on the board. And this now is going to influence how the AI and everything's reacting. So when you're getting your orders, you're looking at the battle for you. You're doing your plans. You're giving your sub commanders their orders. You're not going to be changing that mid battle and be successful with it. And that's going to be influenced. This I put in probably a month ago. This marking with a marker and it doesn't wipe. But if I take a tissue and some water here and I go over it, and I wasn't playing, I just happened to see that I totally forgot I'd done this. Look, it comes 100% off. And it took us a while to get the correct coding on this. So our new boards come out. This is the first time anybody's seen this, by the way. Um, I've got to wait and make sure we don't screen. But look, it's all coming off. Boom. They're like new. And ladies and gentlemen, you saw there were no enemies here first. Yes. And we're doing some really cool stuff. Our solo system that Gunta and I are working on now is we're turning it upside down again. It is incredible. Not only are we doing behavioral type of where on stress that during the battle as a certain sigma type of a reaction that a commander is doing under stress, it starts spreading out and they start doing these aberrant um, two sigma type of decisions where you're going, what the hell is he thinking? Well, under stress, your brain starts doing some stupid stuff. How do you do that in the game and bring that in? So no. we're doing some really cool stuff now.
Now, a personal question. If you didn't have such a smart, good-looking son, you think you would have went to second, third edition? Um, oh, yeah, because I'm the one always pushing for it. Uh, but Gunta is, without Gunta, it wouldn't be as successful as it is. The AI that Gunta developed and what we're working on together is phenomenal. With, with the agent-based um, AI that he developed with my behavioral AI, merging those. Now we're doing the AI to the point where the AI is now in its turn, even for the board games, is taking the position of the player, seeing what the best move as a player is going to be, and then makes its decision based on that. And not many AIs do that. Um, okay, look, I mean, we're talking about uh, Academy Games, which is a good thing. Uva, uh, you, you got a few more minutes? Yeah, I've got to get going pretty soon, but yes, I do. Yeah, I, 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 I could see you get Nancy. <laughs> um, I, I hear people outside there. They're, Kari's telling them not to hit my, uh, not knock on the door, so. Will Uva be producing any new solo-focused games soon? Oh, yeah, Mark very much so. Gunta's working like crazy on the AI for Guadalcanal. Uh-huh. I'm working on the AI and the campaign. The campaign we're putting out is going to be so different. Um, it is, you never, I'm not going to go into it too much, but it's not a book with campaigns, do this, you win, go do that. No, all gone. Now you're playing, depending on how you did during your mission and stuff, there's a 300 card deck coming along that, what happened historically with the battle around you at Kursk and everything will influence what your decisions were or the outcome of your decisions, what the enemy is doing. So if you take this hill or this city on day one, it takes you to a totally different radiant storyline going forward than if you take it on day three. Because historically, if the battle had happen because no matter what you as a commander of your company or your battalion, how good you are, the general battle of the core of going around you is really going to influence no matter what you do, it's going to influence the outcome of your successes or failures. So no matter how good you're doing, it'll be influenced from the outside. No matter how bad you're doing, it'll be influenced from the outside. And you never know how you're doing. You're just playing this game, going on through it, deciding that we're bringing much more storyline with your people and everything. And then all of a sudden you do something. Oh, you took this objective or something. You pull the card and boom, you lost. Here's what happened. Boom, 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 boom. But during the game, you're getting the command of orders coming in. You're getting the newscasting. You're, you're hearing what's going on in the battle. It's all what happened historically and it's affecting your game. So I think what we're going with solo is, and we're trying to keep it as simple as possible. It's going to be very, it's going to be just a conflict of heroes. But solo, you don't have to learn complicated things. We're building it into storyline. And I really love, 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 and I've said that many times, what Time Stories does, that series. What I don't like is that they just make you go down one little maze. There's only one way to win it. Ours are just like in Conflict of Heroes, or I'm sorry, um, Agents of Mayhem, the game you have there. That is that has what we're doing with the solo now. Um, and most people they look at that game, oh, going, oh wow, it's just a, a combat, urban combat type of tactical game. But the radiant campaign that comes with that game is just mind boggling. It is just so market breaking of what it does. And unfortunately, though, most people aren't going to explore all the intricacies of that. So we're taking this in our war games bringing it down to that battle and you're playing this and you're going to be playing anywhere between eight and 12 engagements, totally into it, hoping you're seeing your men die, the people you're getting used to, your sub commanders dying around you. You're losing your capabilities, your pansa or your stugs or your, your T-34s and your frustration and what you're going to do. Do I pull back? And it's not mission to mission. It's just this whole thing flowing and all of a sudden, damn it, I took this hill. God damn it, what? I lost? Campaign's over because of this? And I missed these objectives two days ago, which happened? I didn't see that coming, like a real commander. 
So it sounds like a real time strategy computer game, man. Exactly, but for a board game. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, Jan Heinemann says, "Can he have? Can he have that for Napoleonics?" Oh, uh, by the way, we're working with Graham Tate right now. We have an incredible uh, Napoleonics game coming out. Um, it's going to be two player game at first, two to four player. Um, it looks a lot like the old Napoleon's Triumph type of because I love that game, but we just the rule system we've developed with Graham. Graham Tate is uh, in the uh, British Air Force, one of the top training commanders for critical crews, crews that are in charge of heads of states and all that. And he's a guy training these people, super sharp guy. I mean, sharp. And um, he's, I think he's Scottish. I go, and I saw him in uniform. It says Patty on it for his name. No, no he's go, Irish. Why, or Irish, he's Irish. I go, <laughs> I go, Graham, what's this Patty? Is that like your designation? He goes, nah, all is Irish. We're always called Patty Tate, yeah. Patty whatever. I'm like, really? Here you'd be sued for being, you know, racial or something. He goes, eh, <laughs> you know, I'm proud of it. So um, he's, uh, we're developing a very cool with Napoleonics, and that's going to be, again, a series of things. Um, the first game is going to be two to four player, but it is set. It is perfect for implementing the uh, solo AIs, the Athena AI that we've developed. Oh, I'm going to let you go there. I really appreciate your kindness, your time, especially. I know you're going to you're going to bill me for your time. And uh, oh, you <laughs> so good care of us here. <laughs> I, I really I really appreciate. It. I hope we can do it again, Uva, on another yeah. subject. <clears throat> Look, um, we've had a lot of interest here on on um, what the YouTube whatever channel this is on people that wanted to know stuff about Academy Games. So oh. if you got something new. We can go on half an hour live. Half, I'll I'll try to figure what I just did wrong, and you know, uh, it's good for you. It's good for me, man. Now let me ask you this: Does this then um, save it and is available to watch later on? Yeah. Because you know, the whole thing of this was where the market's going, what what's yeah. happening in the stores, and all that. And it's saved. It's on my channel. Super. I mean, Super. I can send you a link of it, and you could put it somewhere good. else. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you very much, Danke schön. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, people. Sorry for the uh, for the screw up, man. I'll, I'll thanks for viewing, guys. And now I've got to go uh, get my run in and um, get some. You got me all pumped up now. Doce. <laughs>